with having so many videos recently about arcade only games or obscure micro ports of arcade games, micros to NES and so on, this video was inevitable. At some point we were going to look at the weirdest of subsets, the one that's resulted in some truly infamous titles, the computer sequel to the classic arcade game. You know some of these already, these are the games that almost never become part of official series canon, the ones that sometimes truly boggle the mind. And on the classic microcomputers, the Spectrum, C64 and the Amstrad, we had a lot of them. Think of an entire legion full of what's basically the equivalent to the Zelda CDI games, we had plenty of these strange sequels to choose from. They weren't out of the ordinary back then really, back in the day it was pretty common for companies like Ocean or US Gold, when getting a license to port an arcade game over to computers, to also get a license to produce computer only sequels in case the first game proved a hit. And as portentous as my opening was, a fair few of these games actually aren't bad at all. Of the 10 we're covering here I'd say we've got about 5 games that are at the very least okay even if they can be kind of weird. It's just that the bad ones, well, <laughs> they're shockingly, disgustingly, gruesomely bad. And it's only right that we start with one of those. A game that, well I've often tried to disavow the existence of completely, but eventually one has to face the facts of life. If you watched my last video on ports from the Micros to the NES, you'll know I've already spent a bit of time talking about Target Renegade, which, to be sure, isn't that good on the NES. But it's brilliant most everywhere else. When we're talking about arcade sequels on the Micros, this is undoubtedly the best game of the lot. Like I said, it's as good as a beat em up on a computer like the Specky can possibly get. But I'm not talking about this game. Unfortunately Ocean, by way of their label Imagine, couldn't just leave it there. They had to make another sequel, and it turned out to be one of the most baffling, broken, and quite frankly worst games ever made. I speak, of course, of Renegade 3 The Final Chapter. So, ugh. In this game, for some reason that's never quite explained, Mr Renegade, he doesn't have a name, his girlfriend, nor does she, has been kidnapped again, and somehow her captors are from the future and have taken her there, meaning that you now have to travel back through time and ultimately go to the future to rescue her. Now I know it's quite a leap from the gritty and grounded in reality settings of the first two Renegades to frickin' time travel, but just try not to think about it too much. Imagine that you are Neo, I am Morpheus, and I'm telling you to ignore the massive leap because it doesn't exist, ok? Otherwise your head's gonna frickin' explode. Much like the Crystal Maze, we've got four zones to play with, prehistoric, Egyptian, medieval and future. The baddies have enlisted the help of dinosaurs, mummies, Anubises, Captain Cavemans, knights, robots and many more just for the sake of this one bloody woman. The levels follow a simple routine, Mr Renegade waddles very slowly, and I do mean slowly, through the screens. You don't have to engage with basically any of the enemies that you see, although you do have to do the odd jump here and there. Most of the time there's an upper and a lower path, only one of which is correct. After a few screens you'll get to a clearing and you'll have to fight a couple of waves of enemies, which is when you'll notice just how bad the hit detection is, and the ridiculousness of what you're doing will become utterly clear. Trying to get rid of these mobs is torture, and it's pretty hard to do in the strict time limit. However, fear not, because I have a solution. Simply go to the bottom of the screen and spam Crouch Punch on one side. The other side of enemies will bring your energy down to nearly zero, but then they won't actually be able to land the killing blow, because the game is broken. Once one side of enemies is down, switch to the other and do it again. Repeat this whole process twice each stage until you beat the game. If you die, amuse yourself by watching Mr Renegade desperately try to get back on the screen as the game goes utterly do laddy. The whole thing is bugged to hell and feels like it could crash at any moment. And indeed it often does. In another example of the magazines that you loved back in the day actually having their heads up their ass, Renegade 3 received a great critical reception, even earning several 90s and a crash smash. Needless to say the fans didn't exactly agree. Details are still a bit sketchy on it all, 
Going by the words of Ivan Horn in Retro Gamer, he and his cohort Andrew Deakin, in the 8 weeks that they had to make the game, built Renegade 3 from scratch as opposed to using Target Renegade's base, and the amount of varied sprites, a lot of them all different sizes and shapes as opposed to, again, working off of a base model, eventually resulted in very limited animations and a glacial pace, not to mention there still been loads of bugs at development's end. The Horn Deacon duo had produced good games for Ocean before this one, and they would do so after, but this? <laughs> it's a clanner. There is but one positive. Jonathan Dunn's soundtrack is bloody brilliant, as his work often was for Ocean. Still, this stands as quietly infamous sequel indeed. Now I would like to say that there aren't any other games as bad as Renegade 3 in this video, but unfortunately I would be lying. Indeed our next title is another that could easily be described as infamous. However, in this instance and when it comes to the game that appeared on the microcomputers, I'm actually going to be speaking slightly more in defence of Strider 2 than I normally would. Released by US Gold and developed by Teartex, Strider 2 is um, a very non-canon sequel indeed. When Capcom released their own Strider 2 a few years later, they certainly made no reference at all to this game's existence. Anywho, the original arcade Strider had already been ported to the Micros where it was mediocre at best. I think it's fair to say that Strider as a game was way too much for these old computers to handle. The sequel puts Hiryu, or rather the Warrior as the manual calls him, on another adventure through five levels on a different alien planet in order to save a world leader. As a game, it's a bit less ambitious than the original, it's fair to say. Although the design is at least more suited to something like the Spectrum than the original Strider was, even if the levels are kind of uninspired, it doesn't actually look bad. Hiryu has a couple of different abilities. You'll actually be shooting most enemies as opposed to slashing them. And of course, so long as he gets enough energy for a level, he'll magically turn into a robot when you come against the boss. The robot is powerful although he's a bit restricted movement wise. One annoying thing is that you kind of need the robot to beat any boss. If you lose the robot, you can't harm the boss at all and then, well you're screwed as you're going to start back at the boss but with no robot gauge. That's annoying. On the whole, Strider 2 on the Spectrum and other platforms like the Commodore isn't too bad. It's certainly not great but it's far from the worst game we're going to see here. It's a matter of what you would expect out of the system, to be honest. Things get more questionable when we see Strider 2 on the much more capable Master System, or indeed the Amiga, and it truly becomes an all-time stinker when it somehow appears on the Mega Drive, a platform that had already received an incredible port of the original Strider, which was then followed up by this ungodly pile of shite that's basically a complete insult. This thoroughly European mess also came out in the US too as Strider Returns, where it was hated even more. If none of these other ports had existed, and we just had Strider 2 on Specky, C64 and Amstrad, well, it probably wouldn't have been remembered too much, but in no way would it have been on the same level as something like Renegade 3 either. What's on the spectrum is just kind of aggressively mediocre. Let's have something that's actually good next, huh? First here's Century Electronics original Hunchback. Now the UK isn't exactly famous for making arcade games, it has to be said, but this right here is definitely one of the bigger ones and it's also famous for being one of Ocean's first hits as a conversion on computers. Naturally a computer only sequel would follow in the shape of Hunchback 2 Quasimodo's Revenge in 1984, basically featuring more of the same. It kicks off with the final screen of the first game, but then goes into a bit of a different platforming direction, with much more timing and a fair bit more variation. There's a lot more here than just jumping over the ramparts, and what with the nicer presentation and the animation and all of that, 
I'll tell you what, this is actually a bit of a cracker. It's a slightly longer game than the original arcade, and some, including me, may even say that on the whole, this game is better. As far as arcade only sequels go, this one is pretty ideal. And yes, I should mention that, more weirdly perhaps, Ocean also released a text adventure game based on Hunchback. Text adventures aren't my thing at all, so I'm not sure where this one places, although I presume that being loosely based on a famous novel at least helps this adventure out a little bit. Otherwise it's just going to be a lot of jump white, innit? Anyway, Hunchback 2 is a recommended title, for sure, if you like a bit of early arcade platform fun. Really good. Up next, well let's have a look at another one from US Gold. Ocean were pretty prolific on the arcade sequel front, but so were their great brummy rivals. Surprisingly enough, their ones probably turned out better on average. All three of the ones we're seeing here are at least passable, and this one's actually quite interesting. We start with one of the greatest arcade games ever, Atari's original Gauntlet. <laughs> what can you say? Edlog's game is an absolute masterpiece, simple as that. Plenty of great conversions for this too, including the specky one that was published by US Gold and developed by Gremlin. It's not a looker, but it's got basically everything else. It's brilliant. Gauntlet 2 comes out in the arcades, and in the end, we get more of the same on computers for this one. It's still pretty much Gauntlet, it's still very good. But then, a couple of years later, we have this computer-only game called Gauntlet 3 The Final Quest from 1991 and it's kind of different to all that we've seen before. Now it certainly takes some balls to mess with a formula as perfect as that of the original Gauntlet, although the interesting thing is that Gauntlet 3 predicts a direction the proper series would actually end up taking. The perspective has changed. We now have an isometric view, the sort of thing that would be familiar to those who played games like Night Law or Great Escape or whatever. Only here there's a lot more action to be had, as we've still got all the monsters and generators and shooting and so on. But we do now have a little bit of simple puzzle solving, and more expanded dungeons consisting of several different areas. The game is no longer just a simple matter of finding the exit. On top of that, Gauntlet 3 doubles the amount of playable characters. A Rockman, a Lizard, an Iceman and a Merman now join the original quartet for some good old ghost blasting fun. On the whole, does this work? Um, I mean it's kind of so-so. It's quite a pretty game on the older computers, a bit more basic on something like the Amiga, and certainly a different take on both Gauntlet and the classic 80s computer isometric adventure. But in doing this, the game loses Gauntlet's most crucial factor, the relentless speed of smashing through seemingly endless hordes of ghosts, grunts, demons and everything else. I mean, it's called Gauntlet for a reason, you know. This on the other hand is a much slower game now, and in the end that does hurt Gauntlet 3 significantly. On some platforms the implementation of Ultimate style filmation is also very flawed, especially the C64. It's possible and, to be honest, actually not too hard to get yourself completely stuck. In the end this is a mediocre game. But while most of what happens in these computer sequels usually ends up being forgotten later on, something about the isometric approach clearly landed. A few years later, when Atari revived Gauntlet, they continued down the isometric path, and we got the excellent Gauntlet Legends. Well, I like it a lot anyway. It's certainly a better game than this one, but perhaps Gauntlet 3 should get a little bit of credit for it. Gauntlet, being excellent, naturally received many clones. And guess what? One of them belongs here. We move now to US Gold's Midlands rivals, Elite, who followed some brilliant arcade conversions with some rather odd sequel curios. First off, let's begin with their port of the original Commando. Some do question the gameplay here, although I personally really enjoy it, and it does of course have that amazing Rob Hubbard music on C64. Lovely but it was followed up by a couple of oddities. First here's Space Invasion, which was released not long after. 
Now you may look at it, correctly assume that it's exactly the same bloody game, and accuse Elite of being utter knackers. However, this was only released in West Germany. Why? Well, because the original Commando made it onto the dreaded Bundesprofsteller für Jugendliche Fahrdende Mierden, or something like that. It's normally just called the Index. In other words, it was banned, and so Elite released this sprite swap instead, which is fair enough. But then we also have the case of Commando 86, or Commando 87, or Vietnam 65, or as it finally became known, Duet. But versions of it are out there where it's dubbed Commando. Details on this are rough. It may have come out this way as part of a compilation. Anyway, what we have here is basically a complete gauntlet clone. You have to collect documents, there's food to be eaten and indeed shot, soldiers and tanks that generate, instead of using keys to open doors you use cutters for barbed wire. On the whole this is just kind of bland no matter what it's called. Not terrible but not something that's going to stick with you. The sound for the game is a bit silly although the theme music is pretty good. Although it is quite the rip off indeed of Mike Oldfield's tubular bells. As far as all the confusion with the name goes, that's pretty curious. Perhaps Elite's right to making Commando games didn't go as far as they may have originally thought, or Capcom just didn't agree to it and it had to get a quick rename jobby? Who knows? But it's not the only Elite conversion of a Capcom game to have something similar happen to it. Now the story of Commando, or Duet, is pretty boring compared to the story of Elite's Bombjack 2. The original Bombjack is undoubtedly Elite's best arcade conversion, a total stunner in every way. This? I mean, it's kind of a stupidly different game. Now you're fixed on platforms and you can only jump on other platforms that you're in line with. The whole thing's just a little bit off and not very good. But there is so much more here than just a painfully average game. This was originally meant to be a game based off of Thundercats, which Elite got the license for in 1986. They had great, really ambitious plans to release a whole load of Thundercats games, but in the end they only released this rather average one here, The Lost Eye of Thunderer, which so happened to be a nearly finished game called Samurai Dawn they bought from developers FTL and then quickly repurposed as Thundercats. They did this because the other games that they'd planned to be Thundercats titles weren't going to be ready for the crucial Christmas holiday period. One of those was this game here, which eventually ended up being Bomb Jack 2. The C64 version of the game actually still has a version of what's basically the Thundercats music in the title screen. Another one eventually saw release as Beyond the Ice Palace. But guess what? Before Thundercats, this game was originally designed as a computer sequel to Elite's port of Ghosts and Goblins. True story. Once again, Capcom didn't fancy it in the end. You see how messy and weird these games can get, don't you? This is a brief summary of the whole confusing affair. If you want something more in depth on this whole shiban, I point you in the direction of a vid my dear friend Guru Larry did on the Lost Thundercats games a few years back as part of his Games Yanks Can't Wank series. He helped unearth a load of this, so go watch that. Sometimes it seems like these things work out best when we just have a simple little expansion on an already proven formula. That's certainly what we get with Frogger 2 Free Deep, a 1984 title developed by Parker Brothers and published most everywhere by good old Sega because they had the rights to the game outside of Japan. Original creators Konami had now at all to do with this release. Now I'm famously awful at Frogger, but fans of the game will find a new little challenge here. There's rivers to cross and berths to fill as always, but now these berths are spread over three different screens, hence the name. You still get all the arcade gameplay you should know and love already with this one, just with a nice little expansion. Not bad at all and for whatever reason it's still not that well known although it is an official Frogger sequel. Not much drama here, this is definitely worth checking out.
Next up on the menu is another quite odd one from US Gold. One that usually gets mocked and has insults heaped upon it. And not necessarily for bad reason. But again, despite the utter ridiculousness of it attempting to belong to a certain series, it's not actually that bad a game on the microcomputers. I speak, of course, of their 1991 game, Out to Run Europa. US Gold, having already done a hideous botch job on computer conversions of both Out to Run and Turbo Out to Run, they also handled the miserable Mega Drive port of the latter via Teartex, in most people's eyes do another big crap on the series by using its name for a weird game where, instead of driving a Ferrari, you're in charge of a motorbike, a jet ski, and various other vehicles in a weird action game that bears no resemblance at all to the original Out One, beyond it largely being set on a road. So, what's the story behind this one then? For whatever reason, Out One Europa was in development for quite a long time. The game was initially announced by US Gold as being worked on via Probe Software in 1988, disappeared completely, but then resurfaced again two years later, ultimately arriving in the first quarter of 91. In a world where games like this usually had a two to three month development cycle, this game taking over two years to create actually seems absurd. And indeed, the original Out One Europe was a totally different game, one much closer in spirit to the original game, complete with similar music, Ferrari, and loving couple. But this was being worked on just before the announcement and release of Sega's own Turbo Out One. And when that happened, work on Out One Europe was scrapped as it was deemed too close to Sega's official sequel, which US Gold worked on the ports for anyhow. A bit of material from this development actually apparently got recycled into Lowe's. You may think that Out One Europa was some unknown title that just so happened to be rejigged with a more famous name, but no. Perhaps surprisingly, it was designed from scratch with that title by the fella who worked on all of this, one Neil Coxhead, who thought it a good idea to add varying vehicles, settings, and the spy scenario. The original Out One Europe, alas, only exists in the form of a couple of video clips. The actual game remains undumped and in a private collection. But all this info was gathered by various folks at the almighty games that weren't, including an interview with Neil. So, big props to them. Do go check that website out. But what of the game we actually got? Well, once you get over the silliness of it being dubbed an Out One game, it's not really that bad at all. It's a perfectly fine game of action and driving, with a few varied stages and a blasting soundtrack thanks to Jerome Tell. Really, it's not even that bad a game on the Master System. It's just, you know, it's not Out One at all. It is apparently a lot better than the original Out One Europe. According to Neil Cox said, that game was pretty crap indeed. Magazines generally gave it decent scores at the time, and it's only really got that much of a kicking in retrospect when you compare it to the rest of the Out One series. So in the end, yeah, this is a weird oddity for sure, but it's not actually a terrible game to play. Although the story behind it all is certainly a bit more interesting. And even if it is rubbish, hopefully we will be able to play the original game someday. Just for posterity's sake, if nothing else. Of course, we shouldn't be too positive about US Gold. While I think it's kind of borderline as far as inclusion goes, it's certainly worth giving a little mention to the infamous Human Killing Machine, which was presented in some mags as a sequel to their already hideous port of Street Fighter. So yes, you could think of this game, in a way, as being Street Fighter 2. At the very least it uses the same engine as the already rubbish tier text port, but the result is an even worse game where your generic martial arts man goes on a rampage against various stereotypes and their dogs. Russians with hats! Dutch prostitutes, Arabian terrorists, they're all here in this game that is... Well, you really don't need me to tell you that it's utter bloody bilge, do you? I wonder if there's some horrifying alternative world where this actually was the sequel to Street Fighter 2, and Capcom's effort never actually existed. I can only shake in horror at the thought of what such a world would be like. <laughs> Thank you. 
Earlier on, I said I'd be lying if there weren't any other game in this video that was as bad as Renegade 3. The time has come to show that off, and unfortunately, it's another Ocean Software disaster. They're just not having that much luck in this video, are they? Anyway, we begin with the original, and this time it's Yaya Kung Fu, Konami's legendary and influential fighting game from 1984. Still quite fun to play now, this one. And Ocean's home conversions? They were pretty fun too. There's plenty of good times to be had jumping all around the screen and taking down these opponents. All is good, all is well. But then we got the sequel, Yaya Kung Fu 2 The Emperor Yaiga from 1985, and all went very bad indeed. We have a slightly different route here. This sequel was originally made by Konami themselves, but never made it to an arcade. Instead it solely came out on the MSX, and to be honest, in this original form, it isn't much good either, with pointless additions such as a few screens of avoiding obstacles before getting to fights, and much, much worse controls. Ocean's Imagine label would then port the MSX game to the usual home computers, and even some more obscure ones such as the French-only Thompson T0770. And the result? Ugh, it's a total debacle. I'm mainly playing the C64 one, where the only way of light comes from decent music courtesy of Martin Galway. And honestly, most of the time it doesn't feel like poor Lee Young can actually move. I have played very few beat-em-ups that are this unresponsive. For whatever reason, the controls from the original that made perfect sense have been switched around to be nonsensical. This is a game where pressing just the diagonal kicks, but pressing the diagonal and the fire button jumps. Well, some of the time. Honestly, moves just seem to occur at random. The one-on-one -on -one fights are torturous. Hit detection, much like Renegade 3, is non-existent. The game is grotesquely ugly. The opponents are varying levels of cheap, and on balance, it's probably one of the least fun fighting games I have ever experienced. It's the sort of thing that might not even look too bad to you just watching it, but seriously, Try to play this after playing something like IK Plus or Way of the Exploding Fist, and just be absolutely horrified. An utterly miserable experience to be sure, perhaps worst of all on the C64, although it's varying levels of abysmal on every other platform too. Now Ocean perhaps aren't wholly to blame here, the original MS6 sequel wasn't that good to begin with quite frankly, but this port of that is a complete and utter hatchet job and brought the adventures of our Bruce Lee-esque friend to a sudden and utterly decisive halt. Compromised to a permanent end, sad story. And finally, we have a little bit of fun. A game that was never commercially available, but shows some of the fun and games people used to get up to back in the glory days of the C64 demo scene. And hey, let's be honest, any excuse to get Mario in the video and on the thumbnail, right? <laughs> now if I was to start talking about Mario games appearing on computers, if you had a bit of knowledge your thoughts might run to the rather odd Japanese only title Super Mario Bros. Special from 1986, which appeared on the PC 8801. It's a strange one, mainly due to it being a flick screen game, and in all honesty it's not very good, I mean, look at the bloody fin. But I'm not talking about that. Instead, I'm talking about a little obscurity called Mario Bros. 2, which was released in 1987. An unofficial sequel to another fin which might surprise people. There were indeed officially licensed and perfectly okay computer ports of the original Mario Bros. on platforms like the Specky, Amstrad, and C64, thanks to Ocean. Nintendo weren't always so crazily protective of their IPs, as it happens. But what about this Mario Bros. 2? Well, it's a simple game. Mario and Luigi have taken a break from plumbing, and they're working in a factory making gifts. Using both joysticks, you pass a package from one side to the other via conveyor belt, gradually building it up until finally, you stick it in a van. I presume that this is what working for Amazon is actually like, although sadly there's no sign of Donna's cakes anywhere. Naturally, things get trickier when you have more than one package to deal with, and if you let a package drop, well, your boss is going to give you the most frightful of wiggins. Lose three packages, and you're fired. It's game over. 
Some observers will recognise that this is a port of the original Mario Bros Game & Watch from 1983, which actually came out a few months before the more famous arcade game and is officially recognised as the first appearance in the series of Luigi. It's very simple and ever so slightly fun for a couple of minutes, but not something I would rate traditionally because, like I said, it's a completely unofficial title that never saw commercial release. It was programmed by a man named Jim van der Hayden, who was part of a hobbyist programming group named Thundersoft, who in turn were part of the Netherlands-based demo group, The Riffs. You may well be familiar with some of their cracks and demos already if you're into the whole demo scene stuff, as this group from Breda were quite prolific in the couple of years that they were around. This particular public domain title even uses some well-known SID tunes from elsewhere, including a classic bit of Ocean Loader 1 on the title screen. Happily, this PD title has been preserved as a neat little curio. Presumably Nintendo were never aware of it, or it may well have been snuffed. I mean, <laughs> geez. They even went as far as to take down a C64 port of the original Super Mario Bros. last year. Because Lord knows something like that could have incurred a critical hit on their pools of money. I mean, there's only so often you can talk about the principle of the thing before you come off like a complete wanker, to be honest. Anywho, this nice bit of historical copyright violation is a cool little way to end the video. Hopefully you've enjoyed seeing some of these sequels again, and hopefully you've been interested in hearing the stories behind them. Bye for now! Thanks for watching this video! Now if you like this video, please do comment on it. Be sure to have a look at my social media, particularly my Twitter, and if you like my stuff, you want to support it, you want to see exclusive stuff such as wrestling videos for example, have a look at my Patreon. You can join this list of awesome people right here. Alexa Jones Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Andy Cat, Arcade LY Webmaster, Asobi Quan DX, Brian Henniger, Chris, Conrad Pritchard, D. Zalior, Rimron Sutter, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dinty76538, Dustin Cooper, Gary Samaden, Jordi Alex, Glunnafeth, Jay is Manchild, James Brown, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lucas Kaligowski, Matthias Granzov, Martin Pataki, Nate Milbank, Potter Margel, Renby Mon, Rusty Kelly, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Tariq Amir, Tim Wald, Yoko Operator, and to all the rest of the community, all my wonderful, wonderful fans and supporters, thank you so much and goodbye.